uh, and welcome to the Wednesday, October 4th, 2023 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee on this gorgeous, gorgeous fall day <laughs> um, and soon to be yet another torrential rainstorm coming up, I guess, this weekend. So yeah. we will appreciate today and tomorrow and brace ourselves for even more weather coming. Um, as always, we begin our meetings with general public comments. These are folks commenting on projects or uh, in the past, not ones that we are considering right now or this this evening. Is there anyone who um, would like to comment on anything having to do with the CPC? Sarah, can you see anybody? Hands up. Uh, I see no one. You see no one. Okay. Uh, the main purpose of tonight is to hear from five different applicants who have submitted requests for CPC funding for this fall 2023 round. Before we do that, welcome, Jonah. Uh, we have just a couple things to get through. So folks who will be presenting, bear with us for just a moment. The first is minutes. Um, Sarah sent us that today. It's minutes from March the 15th. And for our two new members, you do not have to have been present to approve of minutes. Uh, so uh, Sarah, can you, is there a motion to approve of the minutes of March the 15th? Motion to approve. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Seconded. Thank you. Uh, any discussion, corrections to the minutes? Martha? Uh, yes, on, on the second page uh, under the Historic Northampton Collections Preservation, there's just a dangling um, name. Uh, Jen is mentioned, but there's nothing following her name. So I don't know if the, these sentences got cut off or that was just a mistake to insert Jen there. Um, do you see that, Sarah? Top of the second page. Um, second to last line, th uh, right above the se second to last line. I just want to be sure there wasn't something missing. There is furiously checking for dangling names. I uh, oh, I think that I just misplaced that. That that's okay. supposed to be there. Okay. So that was Martha. Thank you for pointing that out. Any other dangling names or other attractions? No more discussion on that. Sarah, you need to take us through a roll call on this. Is that correct? We, we do, since we're remote. Roll call needed. Uh, so, Jonah? Here. Uh, Jeff? Yes. Kevin? Come through. Yes. Okay. Uh, Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. And one of these days we will be caught up. So that's that's a good thing. Although, uh, I, I will point out to Brian, although the, it's a long ago date, that's, that was only two meetings ago. So we're, we're doing what? <laughs> we don't uh, meet in the summer. All right. all my, it's actually not that all, bad. <laughs> all right. My apologies for my snarkiness or perceived snarkiness there. So thank you for pointing that out, Sarah. Chair's report, I have just a couple things, is um, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago, but uh, did not have our newest member, Chris Tate, with us. Um, so welcome, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you so much for joining us from the planning uh, committee, um, taking over uh, Jana's role. So we have missed Jana, but we welcome you, Chris Tate. Now we have two Chris's, so Chris T and Chris H. Uh, we'll have to keep the two of you separate. And for those who were, who were not here two weeks ago, a second welcome to Kevin Lake, who is taking over Jen's spot uh, for the longtime member of the Conservation Commission. So bringing that expertise with him. So welcome to uh, both of you. Um, Jonah, you're in a little weird position here of being appointed to fill the seat that stepped down from as an elected rep. 
once the election happens in November, I don't know if Sarah had a chance to share this with you, you are ousted from the committee and whoever is elected comes in. So you're in a little weird position of, of with us now, and, and we certainly encourage you to stay, but not being able to vote in the final stuff because the new member will step in. So uh, that's- did not, did not realize that, that non-voting thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's up to you whether you want to continue Okay. Uh, with us or not, and certainly as a informed member of the public, we encourage you to do so. But um, okay. know that you are dis disinvited. It's kind of harsh uh, to vote once the November election comes. Gotcha. Um, and the, vo the vote. When is the vote on these this round scheduled to occur in in late November? Uh, I think it's the first Tuesday in November. Is that right? Isn't that when all elections always are? No, no, I mean the vote on uh, on, oh, these, oh, oh. on these. Okay, I believe we are. Let me look at my schedule here, John. Um, not voting until the 15th or 29th of November. I see. Okay. So, and I think the, the vote will have taken place. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we have um, two folks who are running for those two seats, uh, Chris Hellman, uh, and uh, Lemmy Coffin, I don't see Lemmy here, um, but uh, but both both of them are running, and unless there are write-ins, uh, both of them will be assuming those those seats. So, Jonah, whatever your uh, choice is, we certainly respect that, and thank you for yeah. your for your past stuff. Um, before we begin hearing from the applicants, uh, Sarah would like to take us through a little financial overview to reacquaint us with what the budget is and what our expectations are for these two rounds. Sarah? Uh, so I don't have anything new to add from the, the previous financial report. Um, I could go over that quickly or just see if anyone has questions at this point, whichever whichever works. How about a quick summary of it, Sarah? So sure. Hold on. Let's keep us up up to speed. So last time the um, CPC voted on the set aside transfers that are going to city council, um, they they moved those to the consent agenda at first reading. So we'll approve those uh, in October so the tax rate can be set. And So we have uh, just under two and a half million in requests and about uh, 2.2 .2 million available for the entire fiscal year of 24 for spending purposes. So that, that includes the, the state match and uh, estimated local revenue. Um, and the bulk of that is in the undesignated reserve that can be allocated for any purpose that's about a million and a half and 232,000 um, and change in each of those set aside accounts. So to reiterate, we have two and a half million in requests and 2.2 .2 million available for us for both rounds, the fall and the spring. So we will have our work cut out for us as a committee making hard choices with wonderful proposals. Any questions for Sarah? No, good to go, uh, Martha. I just want to ask about the debt service. Um, I assume that's more than one project, correct? It is. Uh, so that is Pulaski and Smith. Uh, I don't believe Smith was bonded. I think it's Pulaski, uh, the last of Bean Allard. Uh, farm. That's what I mean. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bean Farm, Florence Fields, and the, the second um, Pulaski Park project that funded the Overlord. Right, okay. So how many years do we have left after, after FY24? So the bonding will be completely done uh, in FY27. Okay. So ju just about done. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, Chris Tate and Kevin Lake, be sure to ask questions if some of this stuff come, 
uh, is, I'm, I'm sure some of this stuff is new to you. When we talked about having two and a half million dollars in proposals and 2.2 million available to us, we are able to bond. Uh, that means borrow money uh, if we see uh, fit to do so. And we have done that in the past um, for some of the larger, really large projects like Pulaski, Dean Allard, Florence Fields, um, and have that option to do that in the future as well. So while we are cognizant of financial limitations, we do have that ability to bond if, if so, if so needed. Any other questions for Sarah before we move on? Bev? Yeah, I will ask this as a uh, still relative newcomer. And also because I'm on the uh, Northampton Housing Partnership Board. But the question was raised and I had no good answer for it um, as to why we um, limit the number of uh, funding rounds to essentially uh, to a year. Um, the, the question is founded in the notion that for people who are developing affordable housing uh, projects, the lead time and or the um, immediacy of the need to know about funding commitments locally is hard to fit into any, you know, particularly rigid schedule. Um, and again, I'm relatively new, so I didn't know how to answer that question. Bev, one option that we have is to entertain expedited requests. So if anyone comes in and says, this is time sensitive, we need this for this grant, whoever and whatever it is, uh, we can move that forward at any time, including summers. Uh, it's made sense to us to have these two rounds, but we do recognize the fact that that, that, that doesn't always work for everybody. Um, and we've entertained expedited requests in the past. I'm sure we'll do so in the future. Does that answer your question or help? It does, except for the fact that, and I don't want to get into a you know debate about it, but the one of the uh, parties that raised this issue was a local <laughs> CDC. Um, so maybe we at least need to more broadly um, advertise the expedited processing uh, piece. Um, it's, you know, part of a longer conversation about whether there should be resources beyond those offered to CPA, made available to developers in particular of affordable housing who have, you know, weird long timeframes and also, again, short timeframes for dealing with things like budget gaps. Um, and, uh, I asked this largely as a person sitting on the housing partnership who is looking to kind of figure out if there's a solution to that problem. I didn't even know it was a problem um, until people started to uh, discuss it. So maybe this is a topic for another night. I'm happy to put it there. I'm just trying to educate myself a little bit. It seems like somebody is trying to help answer my question or Chris? Thanks. Um, so, Bev, is this based on a, a, a specific situation where somebody's, you know, felt that they needed to get access to CPA funds and, and weren't able to do so in a timely manner? Is this a hypothetical about something that might happen? So I feel very awkward answering your question specifically because it came up in a conversation that I'm not sure anybody wants repeated. But let me let me say this. The housing partnership is trying to figure out whether or not revitalizing and funding the affordable housing trust fund, which was created, I'm told, uh, years ago, um, is a necessary thing. And so folks have been asking folks in the community, uh, nonprofit developers, et cetera, um, is there adequate funding available uh, from the city and or the CPC? And the question has come back, uh, there's never enough funding, A, and B, the limitations of the funding rounds um, are problematic for those who have to respond 
to the realities of, um, again, development challenges, state funding requirements, state requirements that you evidence that you have funding when they want to make a decision about your own allocations from the state. And so maybe uh, the right answer is to have a conversation um, between this group or whomever wants to participate and housing partnership people, just so everybody has the right information and um, the sort of strategy. Uh, and, and again, this is very specific to affordable housing um, is understood by everyone. Does that make any well, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just follow up by saying I, I absolutely don't want to put you in a in an awkward position. Um, and I would encourage you to encourage whoever's you know uh, brought this issue to your attention to come on down and 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 speak with us. And I would also extend the um, you know, the offer that I'd be more than happy to attend any of the housing partnership meetings and 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 speak on that as well. Um, and then I would make one further observation, which is although this committee has repeatedly, and I think every time um, an affordable housing request has come to us, been supportive of that, very seldom do we have the kind of resources available where we're anything more than just, you know, general support, uh, quick money for for small increments of it. We're, we don't have we don't have the kind of resources available where we're the make or break contribution to a major, you know, multi-million dollar housing project. So it's hard for me to imagine where our scheduling is that big of a stumbling block um, to a, to a, you know, say a $5 million housing project, but, but absolutely. I think, you know, I, I, I we want to hear from people who, who want to, who want to, you know, uh, tap our resources and make it as easy for them to get to it as possible. So um, I don't want to hijack the meeting for this. I know we have a lot of other agenda items. I'll just say two things in response to what you said. Um, uh, there is an interest, um, as I understand it, uh, for availability of pre-development funding, which again, is my understanding, not something that we do. And um, when the state runs a tax credit funding round, part of what they score is what commitments, not theoretical commitments, but commitments you have um, from other sources and local sources are pretty important, even they're a de minimis part of the total funding package. So if the funding rounds don't align with when you have to provide evidence, uh, you can say, well, we're going to go to the city of Northampton and we're going to get some money, but we can't show you evidence right now. I'm just um, adding uh, to the conversation that um, housing partnership people have been party to. And again, my best sense of the next step is certainly I, I will suggest that if anybody is wants to raise issues with the way um, CPA funds are allocated, that they come before this group. But I also think that having a coherent and somewhat unified approach to thinking about particularly how we support the affordable housing piece is a good thing. And so maybe we ought to have some kind of joint conversation with housing partnership. Any other responses to Bev? Thank you for bringing all that up. Jeff? Yeah, just from, I mean, I kind of agree with everything that's been said, but um, I mean, this committee is really only out of action, so to speak, for three months of the year. And the rest of the time we're actively engaged in funding considerations. And like Chris talked about, we are not the <clears throat> we're not the provider of um, the funds that make a lot of these deals go through. We're kind of a means to an end. And having us on board frees up other sources of money, and that's all to the good. But I mean, just this current round we're about to dive into right now. It's like we don't have near um, the funding resources that we need to do this round and whatever may come around in the spring. 
So, but I'm definitely interested in, uh, you know, further conversation because this is interesting concept and would also be interesting <clears throat> to know if other CPC committees around the state are tackling this, this issue. Understood. Any other comments on this one? It will continue to be an ongoing conversation. Affordable housing is so important to us as a community and our ability to provide these local streams of revenue is really helpful for the larger larger proposals as Bev, as Bev pointed out. Any other discussion before we move on? Okay, so tonight is our chance to hear from five uh, different projects, Historic Northampton, the Leeds Affordable Housing, the Academy of Music, City Hall, and Smith Charities for their building assessment. Um, we're gonna go in that order as the uh, agenda set forth with uh, Historic Northampton and three of the city uh, issues, Leeds, Academy of Music, City Hall, and then last, uh, but not least, building assessment at Smith Charities. Um, so folks who are presenting, just a few things. Keep in mind, we've had a chance to read your proposals already. Uh, for some of you, written questions were submitted and you got back those written answers uh, to us. Um, it is not our role to decide anything tonight. Our job is to listen to you and to ask questions uh, if we have them. Um, deliberations will not begin until the middle or perhaps even the end of November, which is when we make these decisions. Uh, we're hearing from five groups tonight, and then we're hearing from five groups two weeks from now in our next meeting on October the 18th. So 10 proposals have come to us, five tonight, five on the 18th. On November 1st is a public comment session. So those of you presenting tonight, uh, make sure to uh, tell members or interested folks, uh, anyone, that if they would like to weigh in on, uh, on your proposal, please do so at that meeting on November the 1st, and that's a seven o'clock Zoom meeting, uh, and Sarah will be sending that, that link out there. Um, and again, to not to be redundant, but to remind uh, applicants that two and a half million dollars of proposals have come in with a $2.2 million uh, budget. So um, we respect and admire all the applicants coming in. Hard choices will have to be made in terms, in terms of funding. Uh, so we're going to begin with, uh, and it's actually three different proposals coming in from historic Northampton. Uh, so we have two representatives from that group. Uh, you folks are on, Lori and Elizabeth. Well, th <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Brian and all, all the members of the committee tonight. I, I think, um, and Betty Sharp is here is here with me, and Sarah, if you can share our um, the presentation that we sent to you, we we can go through our materials. Yep, give us one second. Uh, as as Brian mentioned tonight's the application that you've uh, the proposal that we submitted has three um, three components. One is the clothing collection, a continuation of some funding that we uh, uh, some CPA money that we received from you um, in the spring of this year. And Betty will describe more as to what's happened since then. But um, that's one one piece. Another is a uh, some money that we received in 2019 from CPA, and now we are finally at a position and poised to the next big project, which is a 
in-depth study of the Parsons House. And the, the final piece, uh, which we'll describe is a, is a smaller uh, preliminary assessment of the Shepherd House, which was um, built in 1796. So the total request from us in this proposal is for $125,604. That's a number that doesn't include staff time or volunteer time or pro bono, but just our CPA request. Next slide, please, Sarah. I think before we begin on the details of our project, we just wanted to say again, a big, big, big thank you to the CPC. And I know several of you have already been to our opening or some of the events that have happened at the Shepherd Barn, but in the absence of the CPC, the project would not be as wonderful as it is. And um, so this was uh, from our opening night. Sarah, if you could see, show the next slide. It was a big rush buildup. Um, in our proposal, we described we had more than 700 volunteers in the last year. You can see some of them here working with our contractor, David Dempsey, on the left. His back is to you with the green shirt. He's working with one of the contractors. David is the former conservator, art conservator at Smith College, and he and his wife spent dozens and dozens of hours helping us with uh, the conservation of the artifacts and including the installation. And in this next image, there's not only David is there again, but um, there's a recent graduate now from Smith Vocational who helped us, a, a young woman who is a Northampton resident and a, a, grad, a student at Smith College who was an intern this year. So it was just a, a fantastic project with so many community members pulling together. Next image, Sarah, please. And then since the opening, we had um, we wanted to begin with something that was uniquely Northampton. And so we commissioned three plays that uh, focus on the different stories, different histories of Northampton, beginning with one that took place right here on, on Historic Northampton's property. All of those play performances were sold out. They're coming back again next year. And then since those 12 performances, we've had the Pioneer Valley Symphony Orchestra, we've had an open mic night, we've had a dance. Uh, the Jazz Festival just had their donor event um, at our at the barn and many other uh, groups are and, and programs are planned for the fall until we winterize the building um, the beginning of November. But I just, we wanted to begin this way for those of you who haven't had a chance to come down to the barn to invite you to come and just again, say thank you so much. The CPC funding was critical. Next slide, please, Sarah. So I'm gonna talk about the um, first of the um, items in the grant. And this one is for additional funds for the assessment of the clothing, textile and furniture. This is uh, actually, um, additional money for the textiles and clothing. In the spring, you awarded us a, a nice grant to start the preservation um, assessment for all three of those categories. We've started on all of them this summer, and this uh, shows you the uh, furniture. The furniture um, assessment is going on just as we had planned. There are no surprises there. We have adequate resources and we're getting the job done just as we had expected. Next slide, please. But the clothing collection pr proved to be another matter and is requiring a lot more intensive work. So we're just seeing what it takes to vacuum a hat. Um, we're cleaning all of 8,000 items, not to mention all of the storage areas and rehousing them. And that takes um, a whole lot of time. So you can just see on the lower level of, this, of the slides there, we're redoing the housing for the shoe collection. There are 100 pairs of shoes. And for each of them, a little stockingette insert needs to be sewn um, for, each, for each pair and inserted. So on the bottom of the right, you see the work completed. So next slide. And um, so we're asking for this amount of money to really re mostly for repair and restoring and rehousing of the dress collection. So Lynn Bassett, who's our, our contractor, is holding up a World War I era dress 
the issue for most of these is the way that they're hanging on the hangers, which is perfectly fine. It's just that in our collection, they've been hanging for at least 50 years. So if you can imagine anything in your closet hanging for 50 years, what it might look like. So um, go to the next slide, please. Um, and what happens is um, the wear on the shoulders, the breakdown of the fabric, you can see Lynn pointing toward the, the holes um, where the, the fabric is pulling away and actually breaking. So that needs to be repaired and the new hangers need to be constructed um, so that it can work, right? So the next slide, please. So this particular item, um, another early 20th century fancy dress, um, if you can can imagine a dress with a heavy bodice and a very heavy skirt hanging on that very delicate fabric along the shoulders. And what happens is it pulls it down and it, it, it breaks the shoulders down. So what she has done is you can see on the right hand slide she's pointing to it's like a, a strap you can see and she creates like a, an internal and en bit of engineering where the weight is then borne on the on the waistline or the waistband of the dress and it's hung that way by the by the straps and then the the netting like over the top is just sort of resting there it's not it's not supporting the weight of the rest of the fabric so next slide, please. And so for all of that, um, we need uh, more of Lynn Bassett's time. She's the one who directs these volunteers uh, that you see in the picture here. Um, and uh, we also need more uh, for supplies. So here are two volunteers. We have at least six volunteers going on right now. Some are interns, some are uh, paid uh, through Smith's College work study. But we have a big group, and it's like a, it's like a whole, it's a, it's a whole textile workshop upstairs on the second floor of of um, Damon House. Next slide, please. So that, in sum, that that's what we're asking for is to finish that. And I should say that in the textile in clothing collection, there are about eight thousand items. And so over the course of this, just beginning the summer, so in two and a half months. We went through 400 items, but there's lots more to do. So next slide. So project number two is the historic, a new historic structures report for Parsons House. The previous one was done in 1992, and we some of it is very, very good, and we need to update it. The reason is that Parsons House is our next major restoration project. So we see ourselves as having done Damon now, and we just finished the Shepherd Barn. Parsons will be next, and then following that will be Shepherd House. Um, so this is what we need the, the funds for to do the preliminary study so that we can then do the interpretation and reopen it for the public. It's been closed since 2007. So next slide, please. Uh, we are lucky that most of the original fabric is there. Uh, the, the previous um, restoration group um, left big pieces of it exposed so that you could see it, which is good. But we need to take a very strong new look at the inside of it. Go to the next slide, please. And what we want to know is... What are all the materials that created the house? It's sort of a material science approach to historic architecture. Our interest is in what we're calling the building ecology. Where, what are all the parts that went into it and where did they come from? So if you can think of a building as being the embodiment of all that was available in, in the world to, to build something with and make something from, what are those things that came together in 1719 in Northampton, the natural materials and also some of the other ones. So here on the left, there's the not just the stone foundation, there's the wood paneling, we'll do more dendrochronology. In the um, middle slide, we want to look closely at the plaster. The early report said that in the plaster, there was evidence of grass. Well, what kind of grass? Where could that grass have come from? Lori can identify where it was grown, what kinds of, what kinds of landscape we're looking at in 1700. It also had textile fibers and evidence of soil. So what are these? 
So in, in the slide on the far right is, of course, all the materials for the decorative um, aspects of the house. So next slide. So that that's what we hope to do for um, the Parsons House and interpret it in a new way, something really unique to us, and um, that we hope will be open maybe 2026. So Lori will tell you about the next one. Yeah, and building on that, I think one of the things for for us at Historic Northampton and basically any historic house museum is that, and, and I don't think it's unique to New England, you know, people are sort of reluctant to go into a private home. So for us, one of the challenges, but also exciting opportunities is to really think deeply about Parsons and then also Shepherd House uh, in terms of what is what are the kinds of exhibits or experiences that we can give people that that will draw them in. And so we think kind of thinking with the Parsons house in 1719 and climate change and thinking that, okay, some of those timbers for sure were growing at least a century before. It just gives us a kind of a new way of looking at local history that encompasses not only materials in the natural world, but also the people who were living here and the people before the English arrived as well. So with the Shepherd House, this is a very small piece of our proposal. It's a request for $3,000. We would like to have uh, Eric Gradoya, who, who did pro bono work for us on the barn. He's an expert in 18th century architecture and he's worked all over New England and has a keen sense of adaptive uses, different ways that buildings are being used. And he has, um, al although we have maintained the house and thanks to CPC funding, CPA funding, we've made repairs to the roof and to the porch and to the front porch um, uh, with all the tracery on the, on the front porch. Um, we know there are problems here. And so Eric will, next slide please, Sarah. Eric will go through with us and not only identify kind of a to-do list, but really help us develop a detailed list of, okay, who are the engineers and the consultants and contractors that we need to pull in to evaluate this house. And for us, it's so exciting. We, we are sad to lose Mass Humanities as our tenant, but on the other side for, for the organization, it's the first time ever, ever in the history of historic Northampton that we have the opportunity to look at, to incorporate all the buildings in our entire campus, all four, uh, all four buildings, because even after Edith Shepard, when she died in 1969, immediately after there were tenants on the, on the second floor. And so there has never been a time in the, in, in the last 50 years that Historic Northampton has had a chance to, to think about it. And so one of the pieces that we're talking about, this is a beautiful house. You can see from these details, Thomas Shepard, he did this beautiful painting work and the calligraphy. He is the person who designed the city seal for Northampton. Um, and with the dress collection, this may be really an opportunity, these spaces to begin to show the community many more of the artifacts that we have in the collection that really, you know, so so tell so much more about individual lives and 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 also the history of the history of the city. Next slide, please, Sarah. So this is a summary. This is in our application. Um, so for this this proposal, we're asking for 125,000 for these three projects and then drawing on the 18.5 that was awarded in 2019 uh, from a CPA grant. So the total of the CPA funds um, that would be allocated toward this grant, if you look at all of those would be 144,000. And again, I'll just say it doesn't include um, some of the pro bono work or staff or volunteer time. So thank you so much for your Attention, and we're really looking forward to any questions that you might have. Sarah, you can show the last slide because we're kind of excited about this piece too. This is, we have um, worked with James Lowenthal. And so we're working, uh, all of these are um, dark sky lighting. 
So um, we're working toward becoming an urban dark, dark sky space, um, which will be, I think, the first in downtown Northampton. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lori and Betsy. As always, you put together a fascinating presentation for us. Um, now is our chance to ask questions. Folks have questions for Historic Northampton. Any questions? Um, I want to go back, and I know this was answered in a written form, but I'd like to hear it again. Given uh, the funding crunch that we're under this uh, this fall and, and this spring as well, if we were to give partial funding, how would you see that happening? And what is the priority of the projects? Um. Uh, the way I answered it, I I said what we would do is, I guess it depends on how much you scale it back. Um, so I think projects one and two are really important to us and they have to go forward. So I guess they could go forward on a slightly reduced um, level or we would have to find some other funds to kind of patch in there. And the third one, we'd probably find other other funding for. I think that's what we thought we would do. Thank you, Betsy. And any questions? I had a question. Um, if you're successful in preserving these many thousands of items of textile and clothing items, um, what will be done with them? Well, they're ours. So um, we keep, we maintain them and keep them. Um, I think what this is giving us a chance to do is to start to think about how we can exhibit it and, and use them um, better. For example, we have a really premier um, children's clothing collection. And what's so special about the clothing collection in, in uh, that we have is that almost all of it is has a local provenance. So it tells the story of local people. So we already started talking about doing a children's clothing um, exhibit in Shepherd House. Okay, I wanted to um, <laughs> uh, stage the mannequins so that they're doing naughty little kid things as opposed to just looking kind of perfect and, and sitting on nicely on the furniture. <laughs> I want them to be jumping on the furniture. So we're just thinking about new ways to do that, so that sort of thing. Um, we have, we're doing three programs in November related to the clothing collection where people can come see it and um, uh, learn from the experts. Kiki Smith, who worked with us and is now at Smith, has just has a new book out uh, on it. We're going to bring down our tea guns. I mean, we're going to try to get it out as much as possible. So I think this, it, it's really kind of an assessment too, so that we can just figure out, okay, what are the new ways to get this information out there? The other, I'll just build on that, Kevin. Um, one piece that's really important is that the dresses and the entire clothing collection, it really, as Betty mentioned, they're from Northampton. Many of them were made by seamstresses on, on Main Street. So it's not that they're just dresses that people say, well, my, you know, my great grandmother left this in a trunk and I happen to live in Northampton and dump it at Historic Northampton. It, it's not a collection like that. And because of that, and because of like one of the pieces, the first piece that Betty showed you where the, it was a checker uh, dress, that uh, Lynn Bassett, who is our curator and worked at Historic Northampton in, at different times in her career um, as, a, as an employee, not only as a consultant as she is in this capacity, but that dress for her was one of the most exciting because it's just a dress that any old person would wear. Like we have some very, very fancy dresses, but we have everyday wear, which you just so seldom see. So that's, according to Lynn, who has worked at so many museums and, and historical societies up and down the Eastern seaboard and other and other experts, Historic Northampton's clothing collection 
is of national significance. So for us, just thinking about these next two buildings and how we can use them and how we can show more of these, um, it's it's really exciting. And so it's, it's all of a process. Um, and I think it really in the last five years, I think we've all become, um, not all of us here on this, on this zoom call and everyone like much more familiar aware of like well what are these what are the lives of are generally unrecorded and so i think that's one of the strengths of our collection that we can learn some of the things about who these men and women and children were and 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 re reveal some of those stories yeah we have a mill girl dress that has buttons on it that were locally made and other people have want borrowed it and photographed it and used it because it's unusual. I, I know it's a perennial uh, dilemma for museums. What do you put out front and what do you keep in storage? And since there were so many of these items, um, I was wondering how they might be no longer just in storage, but uh, out mm -hmm. for people to actually um, encounter. Thank you. Other questions for Betsy and Lori? Okay, so again, a reminder uh, to uh, tell your folks, November the 1st is our chance for a public comment session. If folks wanna come and, and speak, that is their opportunity to uh, do so. Um, the two of you are welcome to sit in on the rest of the of the conversation this evening, or we won't feel bad if you disappear and go back to the dress collection and uh, do more sewing and hanging and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you. Moving right along, number two on the list is uh, planning and sustainability, the city, uh, looking at the Leeds Affordable Housing Project and the sewer extension uh, that is going on there. Uh, speaking to that will be who, Sarah? Uh, Keith Benoit, housing planner for the city. Great, Keith, thank you, welcome. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Sarah, am I able to share my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, just bear with me here. Okay, can you see um, Evergreen Road Stewart Extension? Yes. Okay, so uh, very quickly, I only have a few slides here and then we can get into questions or, or more uh, details. Uh, really, um, we have a city owned parcel just over um, just about an acre uh, and we're proposing to get um, uh, one or two affordable housing uh, units on there um, and we just need to connect the house to the sewer so uh, the house is not built um, but there's about a 125 foot gap between where the sewer connection would be and where the current sewer ends um, so we like to extend it about 125 feet and add a, a manhole cover um, and so um this used to be a uh, a water tower and it was discontinued in 1999. And then in 2021, uh, the city surplused uh, the land specifically for affordable housing. Um, excuse me here. And so we do have uh, some support. Uh, we have a recent uh, letter of support from the housing partnership. Uh, the city council, they voted to surplus the land. Uh, our current mayor um, uh, supported a housing choice grant, which looked at four other parcels along with this one uh, to get some affordable housing. Uh, and then obviously as in the, I'm in the office of planning sustainability uh, where the project lead. Um, I did write the timeline here. Um, I think we can, uh, if we get a, a developer uh, or contractor on this, we can move pretty quickly um, and uh, we can get it out for an RFP so we can sell a parcel to a uh, affordable housing developer. Uh, right now, we do, we do not know who that would be, um, but we're definitely willing to um, 
uh, or for someone who might not do, do that. Um, and as always, uh, using CPA money, um, you know, we'll have a uh, affordable housing restriction on it. Um, but really, the goal of this is to um, get some home ownership for um, people who are um, low income um, and, and get a, a few more houses um, on online. And to have a picture of the current site, um, it's been vacant since 1999. Um, and this is a very small type site, it's very tight, um, but we can, uh, we can get a house in there. And here's the, the site plan kind of showing about the, the massing of the, of the building. Uh, and that's, that's just sent my presentation. Uh, I'm happy to uh, answer questions, though. Thank you, Keith. Questions for Keith? Keith, I, um, I guess for the, for the rest of the committee's information, um, the planning board approved that site plan that we were just looking at. Um, I think it was approved as a two family where one of the units would have to be affordable. The other unit could be market rate. Right. Um, so that's just for the committee's information on this proposal. Other questions? Thank you, Chris, for clarifying that. Martha? I got some questions about the budget, which is on page thir three of your proposal. Yep. Um, I just wondered how these prices were arrived at. Um, so that was one question. And then I guess related is there's a site plan. Are there other details that have been developed for this project? So the contractor will know exactly what they're bidding on. Uh, okay. so the the first one for the budget, um, I reached out to a few people for manhole covers and um, the pipe to get a cost of the materials. Um, and I just add a little bit of buffer. And then we had some recent projects that had these line items in there um, and uh, just kind of use it as a basis. Um, there's we've seen a lot of construction uh inflation or material inflation so i did add a little bit of a buff, buffer in there um so i believe it's it it, it you know it's a, it's a good um estimate but um yeah and then the yes but the other documents um if we go forward with the um part of the cost Will be the the actual construction documents to go to bid. Um, so since you are going to do construction documents, the funding comes through. Right. Okay. That answers my question. Other questions for Keith? Um, Keith, is 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 this? A definite go. I mean, is there is there a chance a sewer line would be connected, uh, and then no one, no developer comes forward? It's possible. Um, this, um, it's you know, the reason we're trying to do all this kind of pre work site work ahead of time is so that developer we can just you know hand to them on a nice, with a nice bow on it and say, here you go, please give us some houses. Um, and so I think um, previously we heard from other uh, small developers that um, it was risky because there might be some infrastructure below, um, things like that, and or they had to do the sewer themselves. Um, so we're trying to do everything we can to mitigate that risk. Um, but um, you know our goal and the whole reason that this been surplus and we went to DHCD for other funding to get this ready is to provide affordable housing. Um, so it might require some other incentives, um, but we also, um, you know, 
it's a definite at least one affordable unit. Um, hopefully it'd be, be nice to have two, um, but there might be an opportunity for a market rate developer who normally does market rate um, to kind of um, buffer some of that cost from building the affordable by selling that market rate. And the configuration of the sewer extension doesn't depend on the uh, one or two unit, whether it's one unit or two unit, it's the same thing, no matter what. Yeah, right. This is just the the um, you know the sewer line that's in the street that would service kind of all houses. Um, so it's just kind of at a the kind of at the top of a little hill there. It's barely a hill, um, but it'll connect connect one side to the other, and then it'll allow for the connection to the house. Um, and that connection then can be for one or two units. Thank you. Other questions for Keith? Martha, was that a question? I just want to raise this. I I, I did question when I read the application whether um, doing utility work is eligible for CPA funding. Um, because it, uh, it, it sort of feels like it's something that the city you know, should be doing anyway is extending their sewer lines um, or upgrading their sewer lines as a part of public service. Um, so uh, I guess it is eligible, I'm told, is that correct? Um, and certainly the intent is um, within the guidelines of the CPA in the sense that it will be supporting, we hope, affordable housing expansion. Um, it was just a question I raised. I don't know if other people had that. And 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 again, you know, if we are to support um, the extension of public utilities uh, through this program, you know, does this set a precedent for future applications? Because utility work could eat up all our budget. <laughs> Sarah, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, this project is a little unique in that it's the first one that the CPC has received where the, the only request is the utility work, but similar types of utility work have been included in larger affordable housing projects. Uh, and, and Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, if a private developer were to develop this site, this is something that would have to be borne by them and would not be paid for by the city, correct? Right. There was, there's no funding. So, I mean, CPA cannot pay for it if it's market rate and CWG definitely cannot pay for it if it's market rate. So, But it's also not something that DPW would, would cover just for one lot. I can't speak to them, but um, it's been there for 23 years, 24 years, and nothing's happened to it. So. Chris, how I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my buttons. Um, Martha, is, is part of the uh, the basis of your question that this, um, the issue about whether one of the houses is going to end up being um, a fair market rate rather than a low income housing, or I mean, affordable housing uh, um, component? Um, that wasn't really the genesis of my question, but I, my question was more just that. Um, it seems that uh, you know the public sewer in Northampton is really the DPW's responsibility, um, and we pay taxes to maintain, upgrade um, through our real estate. And I'm just questioning whether um, this is just something the DPW should be doing as a service, um, like they would be extending or repairing any sewer line in the street in Northampton. Yeah, I get it, and I hadn't really even thought about it until sarah's answer which was we've done things like this as components of other affordable housing projects but if it becomes a a fair market housing project does that does that change you know <clears throat> the appropriateness of our involvement and i'm just i hadn't even thought about that either so mm -hmm. uh keith do you have a response for that i think it's definitely a consideration uh i mean uh 
from our span standpoint, we'd love if a developer came by and was able to do two affordable units. Um, but um, you know, Habitat, I mean, it, it seems like they're quite busy uh, for a while with housing. Uh, housing, um, so it may not get to it in a while. For a while, if they even do want it. Um, but I think there was some hesitancy with the uh, the water tower, um, and we have not really worked with other very small developers that do affordable housing. So um, that is a concern, yeah. Keith, can you remind us of the hesitancy of the water tower and how that's been resolved? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you get the tower going down, then the pipes going underground. Um, I, I think there was some underground infrastructure that may or may not, not have been under um, at the time. It was uh, not known where it was, uh, but I think those have been remediated. Um, so there's just, um, you know, any type of development risk, um, especially for, you know, like Habitat that has um, very, very tight budgets and, and kind of uh, type uh, labor and things like that. Um, there's some concern there. Um, and why not wait until a proposal comes in for CPC to kick in the money to do this? Um, well, I think, you know, this is part of a larger grant um, housing choice that we looked at for other city on parcels. And really, you know, we want them to get all, get them all development ready. Um, and they're all funky. They all have something that is just not right um, from a development standpoint. Um, so the city just want to do all the legwork so that we can give them a clean title and a clean uh, land and, you know, has any land um, issues kind of remediated um, and any unknowns brought into the known category. Um, so, you know, we're Oak Street, we're dealing with that, with stormwater and um, other others like that. Thank you. Other questions for Keith on this project? Jeff? Um, why is the CPA viewed as the sole source of the funding in order to, to accomplish this? It is not. Um, we, like I said, we, we've used Housing Choice to kind of develop some of the planning documents. So the permit set that was part of the application that was paid through through Housing Choice. Um, and I've previously applied for um, not housing choice, but another house, mass housing grant. Um, and I was denied um, because we're not um, putting enough density into the um, into the unit or into the parcel. You know, we were only putting six units. They wanted to see like 20 units if they're going to put their own money in. So some of it is just the funding requirement um, that was um, that was kind of after the fact. It wasn't a uh, line item in the application, um, and but that you know the neighborhood will not allow. I mean, it, it doesn't fit into the neighborhood. You know, having multiple units like that. Um, so some of it, these smaller units, um, and you know we've tapped out our. Um, short-term affordable house, short-term rental units, the Airbnb fees, we've tapped that out um, for um, prospect place acquisition for Valley CDC. So um, not the only funding source, but others have limitations. So I'm looking at your budget summary is project budget of 51K. CPA request 51K percent of the for the budget, one hundred percent. Yes, for this portion of getting it ready, it is one hundred percent of the quest. Yes. So then the the question is why why is CPA deemed to be one hundred percent? 
Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, from my perspective, um, you know, I, I'm in charge of the CDBG program. Um, this is an eligible cost, but I have one time a year funding cycle. Um, so not two. And uh, although I program it, it is, um, it can be more challenging um, having one. And my application is due four months before when the money is even available. Um, so that's a little, a lot less flexible than the CPA. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions for Keith? Good to go. All right, Keith. And again, a reminder that the November 1st is the time for public comment. Uh, thank you. We appreciate your showing up. You're welcome to stay. Um, we understand if you are to leave. Uh, and moving on to City Central Services with the Academy of Music followed by uh, City Hall. And Sarah, who's speaking for that? I believe Pat McCarthy, uh, Central Services Director, is here. <laughs> Yes. Hello, Pat. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Good evening. Um, okay. <laughs> good evening, members of the Northampton CPA Committee and the Northampton Planning Department staff, Sarah and Keith. I'm Pat McCarthy, Director of Northampton Central Services Department. I've been working for the city since 2015. I was hired as a Central Services Facilities Project Coordinator. <clears throat> And I've been, a, uh, I've been the director of the Central Services Department uh, since last spring, 2022. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank all the citizen members of the CPA committee for their generous contribution of time, patience, and brain energy. Since 1989, I have worked for a number of nonprofit community development agencies developing affordable housing. Uh, 12 of those years were here in Northampton and Valley CDC. Uh, I especially want to thank you for your contributions to affordable housing and uh, just know without this type of local support uh, or, or CDBG funding, these projects would just never get off the ground. So I'm obviously here tonight wearing a different hat. As stated in our application, our department is seeking CPA funds for the exterior historical restoration of the two major landmarks on Main Street, Northampton, City Hall and the Academy of Music. Both built in the late 1800s, both within the historical district, both steeped in Northampton's rich history of culture, arts, politics, hard work, and entertainment. My predecessor, Dave uh, Pomerantz, used to say that Central Services Department is like the veins and arteries of the city. We maintain and carry out capital improvements of 17 city buildings, two parking garages, six schools, 10 city building parking, or I'm sorry, 10 city parking lots and several city um, and park outbuildings. Uh, we also maintain, maintain all the street light uh, in the city, uh, maintain and, and upgrades. Our department oversees maintenance and upgrades of uh, city elevators, emergency generators, boilers, all heating, air conditioning, ventilation systems, building sprinkler systems, energy management systems, automated logic and Johnson controls, uh, security and access systems, roof systems, uh, windows, doors, etc. Central Services also provides for ancillary needs for all the buildings and offices, such as plowing and snow removal for all city and school buildings and parking lots, um, school grounds maintenance. Um, parking lots, extermination, hazmat remediation, trash removal, custodial services and supplies, office supplies, furniture, office copiers, the, the city inter-office mail system, parking meters, EV chargers, and utility costs and contracts. The Central Services Department and staff are ac accomplishing extraordinary goals and efforts in maintenance and capital improvements of the city's building portfolio. 
The city department is also consistently working on the city's carbon net neutrality goals. These building envelope repairs of these two buildings are in line with these goals. <clears throat> the reason I'm saying this is just to put things into perspective because uh, we are a city department. Uh, so um, I just, for example, we are actually going after capital uh, improvement funds through the city as well. Uh, concurrently, I'm actually doing uh, three applications uh, for our department, one for city buildings, the 17 city buildings, two, uh, another application for city, I'm sorry, for school and school grounds, and third under central services purview is parking, which involves all the parking lots and parking garages. Uh, and just to give you a picture, one of those three, which is the city itself, which I'm working on right now is my request is $2.4 million for this year. And that's in capital improvements to all the city buildings. Uh, you can actually double that because we will be requesting that it's same or more of that capital funds for the school buildings and maybe half that amount for the parking. So that's approximately $5 million we're requesting in capital funds for this year alone. Going forward, it matches for the next five years. Uh, we're consistently working on these buildings on a daily basis. Uh, as you can tell, we, you know, how I explained it, that we really cover all aspects of the facilities. And, um, you know, we have a, um, we also um, take care of office supplies, as I had stated before. We run a store out of the high school, which basically supplies all the city municipal offices with um, office furniture or uh, office supplies. Um, with the help of an architect specializing in this type of restoration, the work outlined in our application is unique and specialized historic restoration of these two important historic treasures. Our department is also concurrently uh, seeking city capital funds for this work. With all that said, I'm happy to answer any of your questions to the best of my ability. I could speak generally to the architectural details, details in this application. However, after tonight's meeting, I will pass on any technical questions I cannot answer onto the architect for the answer in writing as soon as possible for you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, questions? <clears throat> I will ask one, and again, this was this was written one, but I still am curious for a little more information. In the past, the Academy of Music has been the one coming to us. Never mm -hmm. have we, to, since I've been on the committee, has the city come, and and I guess I'm still confused as to as to why is it not the Academy approaching us. Since I understand it's a city-owned building, mm -hmm. but the academy runs and manages it. But why, why the difference? This this request. Well, in the past, the academy uh, might have come independently to you, but we have overseen the procurement process for the um, for any projects you may have funded. Um, so for example, the academy staff are not um, up to date on city procurement. So basically we oversee uh, each project for every building, whether it's the Lilly Library, Forbes Library, or the Academy of Music. Uh, they have their own uh, board of directors and trustees, and we work with them presently at the uh, Forbes Library. I'm working on three projects that they independently went after, one for bottle fillers, handicap, handicap accessibility of the bathrooms and bathroom ventilation. Uh, those three, uh, I think um, the handicap accessibility got funded by CDBG. The, um, the CPA funded the bathroom ventilation and uh, the Forbes library is um, bringing money for the bottle fillers, all related to the bathrooms. Um, 
It's a little bit problematic because if it's not on our capital improvement list, which we have many projects uh, on a yearly basis, uh, these projects that are come in from the academy or forged from the less from the left field, uh, we need to you know shepherd them forward as well as the other projects that we're doing. Simply because they're a city uh, building, we need to do the procurement part of it in oversight to make sure the job's done correctly. Did I answer your question? You did, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Pat? Martha? So just to follow up on that, um, we did, so we did fund the ventilation at the Forbes on our last round. And it was Lisa Downing that represented that application to us. Right. Um, and I don't, I don't recall any discussion of central services during that, but it's possible it happened and I just don't remember. Um, well, so I guess my question about that really in related to these projects, you know, how, how are you interacting with the folks at the Academy? Like Deborah, who does the, you know, she's sort of the director there. Yeah. Um, because in the past it's been Deborah and then her architect who would come to Barbara. request funds. Yeah. Well, um, for example, the bathroom project and the lobby project, uh, Central Services was um, basically the uh, shepherd of both those projects. Uh, we oversaw them uh, from the beginning to the end. Although you might not have heard our name, that's basically my veins and arteries reference there. We work behind the scenes and a lot of people don't know that. At the uh, Forbes Library is the same thing. However, it is, uh, and I did state this in my answer, it's problematic because when the projects aren't discussed with us and we have to oversee them, they come in as an additional project. So for example, at the Forbes Library, they came in one year for the handicap accessibility for CDBG funding. I didn't know that, but I was assigned that project and now I'm working on that project a year later the Forbes Library decided they needed bathroom ventilation and went to CPA funding. I hired the architect for the handicapped accessibility and now the central services had to hire a mechanical engineer a year later to integrate that work into the previous handicapped accessibility work. Another year passed and the academy decided to do the bottle fillers. I had to go back to the architect and say, look, we need to combine these three projects into one to make sure they're all done and not interfering with each other. Uh, for example, if what the Forbes wanted to do was stub out pipes for the bottle fillers and potentially do them after the work was done. And I didn't allow that because I thought if they come up with a bottle filler that interferes with the clearance needed by handicap accessibility, then it'll be peat and repeat construction. We'd have to go back up there and do things all over. So that's why I'm saying it's problematic. Although you may not see us, we're there. I'm also working at the Forbes Library with uh, Deb and Bruce on um, a band shell. And these items get added to other projects that we have, like I said, for the city buildings right now, we're requesting $2.4 million and we're aware of the projects we're working on. However, in another three months, if one of these entities comes in and adds a project, it slows the other projects down. Did I answer your question? Uh, Martha, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. It sounded like some coordination had to get worked out and it sounds like you're working on it. So that's great. Um, the, is it okay, Brian, if I ask one more question? Of course. Um, I wanted to ask about the budget projections because you've got a sort of a five, four and five year, um, almost a five, four and five year request on these projects. Um, yep. So the assumption is you're going to be coming back to us for these additional requests in the future. Yes. Okay. Um, we're also working on the building envelope for Memorial Hall and James House. So um, 
basically, as I explained in the answers to the questions, um, we would take any amount of money. Uh, you know, basically, we are asking uh, money for the capital funds, but um, this project competes with other projects that we have that we're requesting money for. So this supplement could actually have this project start earlier rather than later. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, and I, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, Pat, I'm assuming Deborah from the Academy of Music is on board with all of this stuff and has yes. been kept in the loop and offered suggestions and comments. Yes. Yes, I'm presently working with Deborah, uh, Andrew Crystal on her board, Tom Douglas, Scott Laidlaw on um, their chandelier project. Um, they uh, are paying for the chandelier and central services stepped in and um, installed, uh, hired right builders to install a floor and a beam to support the chandelier over the summer. Uh, we have like a $400,000 sprinkler project we're working with the Academy and they are going to install the chandelier when we have the scaffolding up for the sprinkler work. So we, we work uh, on a daily basis with Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Pat regarding either City Hall or the Academy of Music? I guess Emily? the one question I would have is there, uh, since we're, uh, as Brian said, unable to fund everything um, for this round, let alone what's going to come at us later in the spring. Um, uh, are there critical aspects of what you're proposing that are time sensitive, where if the, if there were a year delay or two year delay, uh, there would be significant deterioration and would actually add to the uh, cost or the difficulty or the plausibility of the project? Um, yes, um, presently uh, both buildings uh, the building envelopes are compromised and the longer we wait, uh, the more um, possibility of water penetration into the building envelope, damaging, uh, you know, wall components. Um, and at the, um, for example, the, the roof right now in City Hall, uh, we had to call for a repair because water was coming into the uh, executive office's snack room. So we're constantly battling this problem on both buildings. And the longer we wait, the more it's gonna cost. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Who knew the executive office had a snack room? That's the, uh, <laughs> one of the home probably shouldn't have said that. Right? <laughs> uh, Martha. This is just something I guess for um, thinking about as we move forward with recommendations um, down the road, it, whether this is the best way to finance something like this. I um, mean, this is a major renovation to City Hall. Mm -hmm. It's a major renovation to the Academy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, are we better off considering, you know, bonding it? I, I don't know. It just, it seems to me that Chipping away, um, you're, you know, we may, I don't know, we may not have this kind of money next year or the year after. And then what happens to the project where it, it seems to me if we could plan it out, um, I don't know, just a thought. Yep. I'd actually like to follow along with that, Martha. Um, you know, we, we talk about how we do bonding. We don't do bonding. The city of Northampton does bonding. We recommend that they do bonding to fund a project that we recommend that they support. But ultimately, we're not a funding entity. We're not a bonding entity. We're a grant reviewing entity. Um, so if it resides in the city to pass bonds, um, why do they feel that they need to go through us to get to this? Um, 
why don't they just float a bond on their own? And this may not, uh, Pat Patrick, this may be outside of your purview, but I, it just, it, as, as Martha was speaking, I was like, if we're going to get into this idea of recommending bonding, let's, let's recognize that that's all we're doing is recommending it. Mm -hmm. And my, most of my career, I have worked outside of municipal government. So I've only worked here eight years, but my understanding is capital money is bonding, but I may be wrong. Any other questions for Patrick? Uh, Julia has. Good. Jeff, good to go. Okay, Patrick, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you can let Deborah know that the first of the month, November, first of November is public comments. Uh, okay. So it might be a good piece of information to pass on to her. Okay, I think Andrew would, Andrew uh, um, was going to speak on the first. So, great, good, okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Okay, lastly, Smith Charities with their building assessment. Carol, are you here? Yes, you are. Yes, I am. I am here. Thank Hi. You for, yes. for bearing with us for an hour and a half. Thank you. So. No. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to share screen with you and walk you through our PowerPoint. Um, can you see that okay? Let me go to the, can you see that? Uh, give me a thumbs up maybe if you can see. Yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, great. So, um, so as you know, my name is Carol Gray, and I'm a trustee with Smith Charities. Um, Smith Charities, uh, well, I'll go into the history in just a moment, but to give you the, the overview of our project, we're requesting $25,000 for an updated historical assessment from Jones with set architects. Uh, you uh, included with the application was the, uh, the assessment that they did uh, more than a half decade ago, 2018. Uh, and so here's the breakdown in their letter saying um, what the cost would entail. Um, uh, based on uh, a couple of the questions that came from your committee, I asked Jones was said, could they elaborate more on uh, the need for additional um, drawings or specifications? And here's what uh, they emailed me back and they said the old assessment was done under the ninth edition. I assume that means of, of the building code. The building code will now be the 10th edition and a new stretch energy code. There will need to be a complete review of the code issues associated with the renovation. Uh, we assume, whoops, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, we assume uh, the scope of the work will change as a result. So that explains why they need to do more drawings and not just plug it in new prices. Um, to give you a little background about the charities, so the organization was set up in the mid-1800s as a result of the will by Oliver Smith, who was a, a wealthy person uh, from Hatfield, and he set up a charity that was based on mortgages, actually, so our uh, we fund these gifts, and the gifts go to people like widows with children under 18, tradespeople, um, including nurses, uh, plumbers, electrician. Uh, so there's different categories of gifts for people that Oliver Smith thought were needy and worthy uh, and, and uh, worthy of, of a hand up. Like, like he, he himself was uh, the child of a, a mother who was a widow. So, uh, so giving to widows is a, a big part of the, the gifts. Anyway, um, and the gifts are funded through mortgages. Uh, so we actually loan out money to um, a small number of uh for a small number of mortgages and anyone can apply. Um, and then we use the interest on the mortgages to fund these gifts. And so uh, so the, the amount of money we have depends partly on how high or low interest rates are. Uh, so uh, the interest rates have gone up a little bit. So over time, that will mean that um, we uh, have a little bit uh, extra money uh, to go towards things like uh, restoration inside the building. Um, uh, so uh, again, here's a quick summary. The building itself is uh, in the heart of the downtown. Uh, it was uh, designed by uh, a local architect, uh, William Fenno Pratt, uh, in the Victorian Renaissance style. Uh, and it's uh, it's really 
a landmark building, uh, partly because it's been used for the same purpose that it was built for um, going on two centuries. Uh, and, uh, and it's also part of the historic downtown district. So when Northampton applied to get uh, um, preservation status for the historic district, this was one of the buildings that was featured. Uh, and here's an old picture of, you know, long ago. Uh, uh, going over, uh, we we've, we've, have been grateful to get uh, CPA funds in the past for doing restoration work to the exterior. Uh, here's some of the work, the cornice that was completed, uh, other work done on the, on the corners. Um, this is the big crane when they when they build when they do work to the exterior they have to build a scaffolding it's it's a very involved project um so uh in terms of our other funding sources we have been successful at getting other grants as well thankfully um we got a fifty thousand dollar grant from mass historic uh, back in 2020 and we got another one just recently when i was before you before we were in the process of applying and thankfully we got that grant for fifty thousand um so uh so the good news is we're we're making good headway on uh getting that the exterior restored and um so we uh, the the work uh, from the last grant cycle because we we're applying for the mass historic grant and they require a different bidding process and very uh, very specific re requirements for doing all preservation work uh, we needed to wait till that grant was either approved or disapproved before we can actually start the bidding process so uh, so. Uh, the grant was approved, and so now the bidding process is underway. Um, we're also going to apply for a Mass Historic Preservation Grant. They are up to $10,000. Their letters of inquiry are due uh, November 6th. Uh, and we are hopeful that with this updated uh, preservation plan, um, we can craft a, a, a long-range cap plan for doing historic preservation over the next five to ten years and uh, that will include um, it'll finish off the exterior uh, and the interior will be uh, hopefully not as costly as the exterior um, uh, we'll see uh, and we'll work on that little by little and uh, we anticipate that uh, we will get grants hopefully for some of the interior work we will also be funding some of that ourselves um, getting grants from uh from the state and the town for the exterior has really been a priority since it is visible to the whole downtown and it is part of the whole landmark of of the town uh for the historic district uh we have been contributing to the building in the past uh we've spent more than fifteen thousand in the past uh, few years over the building and uh and we'll this because uh, actually this whole idea to, to do this updated assessment came out of the conversation um, we had during the last funding cycle. People were saying, well, what, what are the numbers? And where, what's, what's been done? What hasn't been done? What are the most current numbers? What's left to do? All of that. And so, um, so it was actually recommended that we uh, update this, uh, this assessment. So uh, we are doing that uh, with this application, hoping that you will consider funding it so that we can uh, have the most current numbers, we can have the most current uh, specifications for building code, and we can put together a five to 10 year plan for restoration. Uh, here's just another picture of uh, the types of restoration that have been done on the exterior. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, the work that's proceeding, so last time we were here, one of the things you funded was collar ties. Those are uh, we're just sistering up of the ties uh, in in the roof and attic area, and that's going to be done before the final uh, the restoration of the exterior, uh, and then all of that will be completed before they actually do the assessment to say here's what's completed, here's what's left, and here are the most updated costs on everything. So um, that's a quick overview, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. um, and congratulations on that $50,000 Mass yes. Historic Grant, second in a row that's been commended on, on that. Thank that's uh, um, it really shows the good work that you're doing. A yeah. question for Carol.
Nobody, nobody. Uh, Martha, as your, as our historic person, nothing to ask. Um, no, I think Carol has answered the questions that I had. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Bev. Um, I think you answered the question as well. I just want to um, clarify that I think a lot of people on this committee um, really value what you're doing and the importance of the building, but also wondered what the end game looks like um, and whether or not the charities are capable of being uh, a steward, if you will, of this asset. And that's by no means a criticism. Um, it's uh, more trying to figure out whether what we're investing in is going to solve the problem or just open more doors for funding needs. So I think what you're saying is that this latest assessment that you're asking your architects to do will give you a better sense of what the totality of relative near term, I know you can't look 50 years out, um, improvements will need to be. And um, I think it would really help if that could be accompanied, uh, Not it's not necessary, but if uh, it could be accompanied by um, uh, sort of an assessment of how the costs that are articulated in that study would be covered in the timeframes in which they need to be uh, so as to preserve um, the asset. Yeah. So again, this is about my memory of the sentiment of the group last time out. You did speak to a number of those points, but it seems to me that if we're going to go and do this thing, there ought to be a meaningful conversation that follows next time uh, you're looking for funding about what the long term is. Yeah, no. Thank you for those comments. And yeah, we're we're trying to be the best stewards we can of the building. And the good news is that uh, the building, before we came with these uh, proposals, not just to you, but we've gotten a hundred thousand from the state. So uh, you know, it's it's we're not just relying on you by any means, but uh, but we are a charity. We're not a we're not for profit. So there's no way that. Um, you know, most charities could fund uh, the stonework of an 1800s building. But thankfully, you know, that's part of why CPU was, was created. It was because a lot of historic buildings aren't owned by multinational companies. They don't have a lot of money. And so, but they realize that they're things that are cherished by the whole community. And so the historic district is wonderful and worth preserving. And so, um, I mean, I think, we're good stewards because we're getting this done. I mean, we're, we're grateful for your help for sure, but it's, you know, we're following through that first round that you gave, all that money was spent. It was spent responsibly. All the paperwork was filed showing completion. We're using some of the most reputable, well, the most reputable architects that we know of, Jones was at Architects. The stonemasons are the people that uh, worked on the state capitol in Boston and other known historic structures. We're complying with all the extensive requirements of mass historic in terms of bidding processes, in terms of completing it work well. I think those are all examples of great stewardship. Um, I, I think implicit in your question is, are you going to keep coming to us to ask for more money? And and at what what is it going to stop is probably what I'm hearing in your question. And I, I guess I would say, um, you know, older buildings need upkeep. But the good one good thing is once this facade is done, nothing had been done on the facade until we started this ball rolling with the, the 2018 assessment that did that, um, that you helped fund that like gave us the wherewithal to figure out a plan. And since we got that, the, the facade is just about completed. I don't know if it's gonna be all the way completed in this last round, but with that 50,000 from Mass Historic, that certainly helps. But once that's done, it might not need to be done for another 175 years. So you won't hear another word about that. At least all of us will be long dead before anything needs to be. And, and hopefully that facade will be even stronger because we were repairing things from 1845. So 
you know, it's it's not surprising that a building that old, actually it's held up kind of remarkably well, but it, and, and it's also when you go to fix the exterior, it's costly because you need to have these people who know how to do historic preservation and they're costly. Um, I'm hoping the interior will be less costly, but it's also, um, it's the kind of work that we'll do it little by little as we can afford it. And um, will we come to you for some requests? We might. Um, will we try to do some of it ourselves? We hope to. Um, do we hope that with increased interest rates, we're gonna actually have a little more money to actually work on the interior? I hope so. I Right now that the second floor isn't used but it's in the heart of the downtown. And I think that it could be, it's a lovely second floor. It could be um, used to maybe house another nonprofit. Maybe it could be a community space where, you know, people in the community could, um, I know in some, like in Amherst, the, the, the Unitarian Church rents out a lovely meeting room. Maybe there it could serve a purpose like that. But right now it's not in good enough condition. It needs like heating systems. It needs, um, it needs a bit of work. It hasn't, it's, been empty for for decades um so i think part of being a good steward is not just saying it's okay to just leave it empty and let it you know not be kept up you know we want to try to make it uh, you know a more valuable asset for the community um oh and by the way um we did hear you last time about allowing the public in and so we we held two open houses and uh and people came and they found it fascinating and we had a little talk with pictures of about the whole history and a few people couldn't come then, but we have their emails and I'm gonna invite them to come uh, at the six month mark. We'll do it, you know, another open house then. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're doing what we can. I'm not a staff person, <laughs> you know, I'm just somebody who cares about this charity and, you know, um, you know, all the, the electors uh, are elected to serve a term, but, um, we, we have one staff person for the organization, but but uh, but all of these grants and things are things that we're just doing as you know volunteers. So, but I'm happy to hear other questions, and I hope I've addressed some of your concerns. And I invite you to come and look at the building if you want to. I'll do another tour uh, after the holidays. Um, Thank you. Deb, thanks. Thanks for the reminder of where where our discussion was uh, a number of months ago. And Carol, thanks for that. Uh, answering of Bev's question. Other questions for Carol? So last time, Carol, again, uh, November 1st is the public comments. If folks that you know are interested, please remind them of that sure. date. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for all your service, because I know you're all volunteers too, so it's a good cause and I appreciate all your time. Thank you very much. Have a good day. All right, quarter of nine, not too bad. We have a few five different proposals, all interesting, all requiring our uh, thoughts. Um, next item on the agenda, and this is maybe new for Kevin and uh, Chris Tate. Uh, if needed, we try to schedule site visits to some of these places uh, for folks who've never been to... Um, inside the Academy of Music, or in this case, outside to look at the work or perhaps looking at the clothing collection. Uh, so now is the time where we try to come up with a date or dates, or at least throw that out to Sarah, who can do a little doodle doodle thing, is that what it's called, um, Paul, to try, to try to get us there. What are people thinking about where you would like to go for these, um, 10 different projects. Do any of them call out for a site visit uh, for folks? Any places that people would like to go? Chris, is that a hand or a head itch? It's a head itch, but um, if, if if I'm not the only one, I would like to take a look at the City Hall stuff. I'd if like it's to just do me, too. I'll, I, I'm sorry? No, Chris, I'm with you. I'd like to do it too. Okay. Um, Did you want to see the attic? Oh yeah. <laughs> the weird yeah, mask. Oh, Pat's gone, but I'll I'll speak on behalf of him. They're not gonna let you in the attic because of the asbestos issues. I I would I would guess. Um 
I've always wanted to see the attic and it's always been like, no, it's all encased in. Well, I go in asbestos well, attics but... every day. So I'm. <laughs> um, but it, it it might, I can reach out, but seeing the attic itself might not be possible. Okay. Okay. So city hall is one. What others? I mean, if we were at city hall, we could step right over to the Academy of Music, I suppose, right? We're looking at exterior stuff. Yeah. Folks would might be interested in that as well. I'm seeing some head nods. Yes. Okay. So City Hall and the Academy. Let's see. Um, the Boggy Meadow uh, Road Trail there off of 66. Uh, we could probably do that on our own. Sarah, what do you think? Is that sure. I mean, that one's pretty easy to, to see and, and visit. That's uh, one of the main routes into Fitzgerald Lake. Uh, I think folks could handle that themselves, probably. Is that right? Uh, how about the uh, staying on that thought, the Rocky Hill Greenway multiple use trail? That's what I meant off of 66. Um, that's another one folks can walk, correct? Uh, unless, Sarah, you want to arrange an opportunity to. Um, to take folks through that, if they if people were interested, is anyone interested in going going there to the Rocky Hill Greenway, uh, going down to where the gas it's a, it's where the gas tanks or propane or no what is it Sarah? Oh, it's it's the uh, I don't I forget the name of the facility, but it's where they add the smell to the natural gas pipeline. Mm -hmm. Uh, are folks interested in scheduling a visit there? I'm seeing no's now that we know to the smell to the natural. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't smell there, but it's where they put the smell in the pipes. And that's another one that's that's pretty accessible on um, on your own if you want to go check it out. Uh, so if you're coming uh, west on 66, go past the House of Corrections, there, and there's an entrance to the conservation area with a gate on the left. And folks can park at that gate, is that correct? Yeah, not right in front of it, but there, there is ample parking on either side. Okay. Um, how about historic preservation, uh, uh, historic Northampton? Folks interested in going looking at perhaps the clothing collection? Is that something we might be interested in? Thumbs up, anybody on that? I'm not seeing any thumbs up. We can just get pictures. Of that, okay. Uh, uh, let's see. The pickleball creation is just going to the playing field, right? I and mean, there's not a whole lot to look at other than us just going there and seeing where it might be. Is that correct? I mean, I don't think we need a a tour of that. Um, so it looks like Academy Music and City Hall. Uh, the, oh, the, the the Leeds project. That's also a drive by, right? I'm just looking where that is and knowing the sewer line is going to be extended however many feet. Um, so I'm thinking uh, just the academy and city hall. Is that is that correct? Is there anything else that stands out? No. Sarah, can you come up with date or dates and poll us about that? Sure, I can definitely do that. I'm generally when are people most available or most unavailable? Like would, would during the day work or early evening? Yes, thumbs up during the day. Okay. All right. I will I will check with Pat and send out some options. Great. Good. Thank you. Anything else on site visits? Okay. Um, Sarah and I had the opportunity uh, last week, the week before, I think it was, Sarah. Um, Tom Callahan is a member of the Community Preservation Coalition Steering Committee. And he approached Sarah and me about meeting with him um, uh, to discuss a couple things. For those of you who don't know, the Coalition has a steering committee. 
is sort of like an advisory committee. It meets four times a year. It's not members, it's not that any staff people of the coalition, although I imagine they attend, but the steering committee is supposed to guide the coalition uh, in, in some of its work. And Tom approached us, one, just to get feedback on some of the issues that we're dealing with and affecting us and wanting to hear uh, um, from us. Uh, he also approached us about asking if one of our committee or staff people would be interested in becoming a member of the steering committee um, and helping to guide the Community Preservation Coalition in the work that they do. Uh, Sarah kindly has uh, offered to be that person um, to attend, if in fact we were chosen, I don't know what the exactly what the vetting process is. Uh, he came and approached us and to gauge interest in one of us being on this committee, but I didn't get the feeling that it was a done deal. If one of us wants to be on, we're automatically on it. Didn't quite grasp that. Uh, I thought that Sarah, with her expertise, uh, can take some of our concerns and and move them to a higher level and help to uh, help the Community Preservation Coalition to to do their job and to perhaps be a better advocate for us and for other communities as well, and to hear some of the concerns that we have had and will continue to have. Um, so essentially what I'm recommending, unless another person is is really chomping at the bit to be on this, on this committee, uh, Sarah, with her expertise, again, has kindly uh, volunteered. Is that the right word, Sarah? Uh, since it would be part of your job, so it's not really volunteering, but uh, as part, it, fold this into your work uh, and throw and throw your name into the, throw your hat into the ring, is that the right saying? Uh, and ask to be considered to be, to be on this committee. Um, the questions or comments about that, are, are people good with Sarah being our go-to person? Yes? Okay, good, it seems. Thumbs up, thumbs up all the way. Um, and Sarah, once again, you're you're good with getting back in touch with Tom and saying that you would be honored to take on this role. Sure, I can do that. I mean, and just to add a little bit to what Brian was saying, you know, I think it would be really valuable to have an additional Western Mass perspective for the CPA. Um, you know, there's a it's getting to be even increasingly, it seems like with the addition of Boston and some other Metro West communities, it, there, there's a heavy focus on on the Boston area. And I, I'm not sure that the needs of Western Mass and rural communities as well, uh, which I can provide, is really being looked at. And there are some you know, just basic modernizations that could be done to improve the CPA, um, like the first 100,000 and uh, valuation right now is 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 exempted, but there's no opportunity for any community to go, to go above that. Um, you know, and I have some concern. I think others do as well that you know, as taxes go up and cost of living increases, that that's not enough for a lot of towns to keep this tenable. So you know, just some ideas, and 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 I'm happy to pass along any any interests or questions or concerns that anybody on the committee has as well. Don't forget the due structure. I know. I mentioned that. I noted that when I sent the minutes along. Like we, we noticed this, but it it seems to be the same this year as it was last year. And then take our suggestion. Oh. Great. Well, thank you, Sarah. One one of my favorite stories is I remember years ago I went. Forgive me if I've shared the story. I went to the debate between uh, Ted Kennedy and Mitt Romney when Mitt Romney was running against Kennedy for Senate, and it was at Holyoke Community College. And Mitt Romney said, um, I've traveled from one part of the state to another, from Boston to Worcester. And I was waiting for at least to Holyoke, but, but he stopped at Worcester. And the crowd burst. It was, we, it was, we were in Holyoke. The crowd burst into laughter. And Mitt just didn't quite grasp it. So um, they're striving for geographic diversity here. And I think they're diversity probably ends at Worcester. So incorporating a town um, actually west of the river is 
is pretty stunning. So, uh, so thank you. So again, thank you, Sarah. Um, any anything else about that one? So when we come back in two weeks, we'll be hearing from the other five uh, of the uh, of the projects. Uh, Sarah is being inundated, evidently, with um, pickleball letters of support. I, there's a so every morning when I come in, I don't even know where they're coming from. If they're just falling from the ceiling, there's a packet of letters. So I I think we're up to a hundred or so. If anybody, I'm and I'm filing them in the. Um, the application folders. You know, Sarah, I know the where they're coming from. Gets, oh, do you? Where are they coming? I know from? everything about this. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's a lot, and they're from all all over Western Mass. Everybody wants to. Say. Yep. Well, Scary stuff, right? <laughs> uh, well, our meeting November first may go for six hours <laughs> as we listen to pickleball after pickleball testimonial. So. Um, so, so Brian, it, it it is pretty likely. I will say on November first that it that there will be about fifty folks from the pickleball community showing up. There's over three hundred and something on the list who are, you know, saying, "Yeah, we'll be there." Oh. Right, yeah, well, that's, that's there might be enough. like some way to so rein it in. Grab your caffeine, and <laughs> it'll be it it'll be it'll be an experience. Uh, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? We are good to go out of here before nine. That's not too bad. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks on October the 18th for our next round of meeting with applicants.